One of the things that uh, uh, happened was the Rock Chalk Chant and uh, the nickname of the Jayhawks all came out of the wartime experiences and just brought fond memories back to those people that were engaged in the war that were Kansans. And so the traditions and the spirit just grew out of, uh, let's say, tougher experiences and uh, it centered around the university here. Dr. Naismith invented uh, the game of basketball at Springfield College in Springfield, Massachusetts. He was told by the president to come up with some game that would uh, serve between football and uh, the spring sports, so he came up with the game of basketball. And in 1898, he was uh, here at the University of Kansas and coached the first uh, basketball team at the, at the University of Kansas. In fact, he was the head coach at the university for nine years. He, uh, I think, should be given credit for inventing the football headgear. When he was there at, uh, playing back at Springfield in football, Amos Alonzo Stagg was another one who was his coach and also a player on that team. And Naismith was getting cauliflower ears. And uh, this, uh, and so he took one of those old footballs, which has, was kind of rounded, and he cut it in two and made some flaps on the, on the foot, out of the football and put the whole thing over his ears. And when he got out on the field, Stagg snorted and said, Jim, what are you trying to do? Butt like a goat? Old timers, uh, they coach football, that is all. Basketball, just seasonal. And then I was there two years at the university, and I went to the teacher's college at Warrensburg, then back here where I've always wanted to be. And along came the last game of the season, and it was snowing a little bit. There were a few horses and buggies tied out around outside of the field. And it was a miserable day. We nearly froze. And Nebraska beat us about 38 to nothing or something like that, and I haven't got over it yet. Went to all the basketball games and all the football games. <laughs> Wouldn't miss those. And after I got out of school, I, whenever I was home, I would go to the games. I remember one in particular when I think we either tied or won from Nebraska. It was just, I nearly yelled my head off. <laughs> You know, the story that, uh, uh, that Doc Naismith, it's told around here that Dr. Naismith was the inventor of basketball, Dr. Allen was the inventor of basketball coaching. And, uh, and, and he had always argued with Doc that, uh, that you, don't, uh, you don't coach basketball, you play basketball. He had three schools that he was coaching basketball in one season. He had Baker, KU, and the Haskell Indians. And so the schedules had to be, <laughs> some of the games played early at night and uh, the others later at night or in the afternoon. Had, had three undefeated teams one year. And Dad uh, did a lot for Dr. Naismith. Uh, they started taking contributions at our basketball games uh, to send Dr. Naismith and his wife to the Olympics that coming, that coming year, the first time that basketball had ever been in the Olympics. And, uh, in one se two seasons, I think. They raised enough money to do that and have a little left over for him when he got home. Ford was quite a psychologist, and uh, uh, he decided to get us all pumped up, so uh, just before we went out on the field, why, he said, everybody pair off. And he paired off with our captain, who was named Zuber, and they started slapping each other in the face, and everybody else was supposed to pair off and slap each other on the face. And, if you haven't tried that, why, believe me, it, uh, it really gets you fired up all right. The only trouble was, we were all fired up and went charging out on the field, and uh, it turned out there was at least uh, 30 or 40 minutes before game time. <laughs> and so it kind of wore off. There's a spot in dear old USA where the folks are gay.
the campus stopped just at what is now between Bailey Hall and uh, administration building, we called it in those days, Frank Strong. The trolley went right between there. If you had to walk across the campus, you did it on boardwalks with cracks, and it was very rainy that fall, and there was a lot of mud, and the boys used to wait till they'd get a girl on a on a piece of walk that was not very solid, then they would bounce it and little geysers would come up. And we wore fairly long skirts in those days. And so the great consternation. We started bringing in the grade school kids with a teacher. She could bring 10 youngsters for nothing and she got in free. And we filled that south end. Now those are the guys that have kids and youngsters and <laughs> mothers and so on, all coming in. But it's a, it's a homecoming. As you probably know, the relays got to start in uh, 1923. Dr. John Altman, who had been a great athlete here in football in the, uh, in the real early days, and he sold Dr. Allen on the idea of uh, conducting relays. But prior to 1920, or 21, we had no place in which you could conduct a, an event of this kind. I was up here to the Kansas Relays from high school, but uh, Brutus Hamilton, the track coach, never said boo to me about coming here. With my uh, summer savings, I caught a train, came up here, got off the train, walked up to the uh, Deluxe Cafe for breakfast, and while I was there, I called the uh, coach told him I was in town and would like to go to school here but had to have a job. So uh, I think three coaches and one of the trainers came down, talked to me and uh, they fixed me up with this job so I uh, stayed here and went to school. At the age of seven I was burned in a gasoline explosion at a little one-room country school and my 13-year-old brother was burned so severely in that fire that uh, he lived only nine days I was supposed to have had my legs amputated. Uh, the doctor said, told my parents that uh, I'd never be able to use my legs, just, they'd be useless as appendages, and that I'd never walk. But I didn't like the idea of losing them, and I uh, objected. By the grace of God, I learned to walk, and uh, by the grace of God, I did a little running. <laughs> I couldn't count the number of times that I fell when I was trying to learn to walk. But I just pulled myself up uh, a piece of furniture or something and tried it one more time. And uh, I think the individual who's willing to, to try just that one more time will eventually find that they'll succeed. We used to make those long bus trips and come back after the game, get in here at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, get up next morning and go to work. Uh, that, that was really tough. When I look back over the books, look at the games that we played, it always seems like that it was only yesterday and I can almost remember everything that happened. Swing out the crimson banner, boys, the crimson and the blue. Swing out the emblem of KU, devotion strong and true. Bring out the old ancestral drum with a hymn that's bound to make things hum. Give a rock chop, give a day hum, give a rock chop while we sing. 
blast on the whistle, calling everyone to their first classes. They come from all over the hill, some of them walking from the dormitories, sororities, and fraternities, and some riding in jalopies like that can. We played our last basketball game on March the 6th in 1943, and we played in the Hoke Auditorium against Kansas State. And they cleaned us out, and I remember Doc, I say cleaned us out, they just took the campuses and took all the the guys away from the campuses into the service to wherever they were called to and Dr. Allen I remember taking us after the ball game to Fort Leavenworth in his big car. We had to depend on people who were 4F, couldn't get into the military services, 17 year olds and uh, then we had some uh, Navy men here that uh, we could use for that time but we could only practice an hour and a half a day with those Navy men because they had other duties that we were at war. very strong time. It had come after the war uh, and uh, we were rebuilding. Uh, Doc had had a great group of athletes during that period of time, Ray Evans and Otto Schnellbacher, uh, uh, some really fine Charlie Black, uh, number two. There were two Charlie Blacks that played in Kansas history and Charlie Black number two as we called him and, and uh, those were great players coming back after they had been here in the early 40s, late 30s and early 40s and then they returned after the war to play one year. And, uh, and they were championship caliber athletes. In those days, there was a rule for the NCAA that you could not approach a player unless he had approached you first. If he had written you a letter or called you or something, then you could talk to him. Well, obviously that rule was not strictly enforced, but uh, nevertheless, that was the rule. And you, of course, you would one of the things you would do is ask alumna to talk to the person and ask him to uh, ask the player to call, contact you then. The only time we ever flew by plane was when we went to the Orange Bowl in January of 1948, and it was a big thrill for us. We just, uh, we just couldn't believe it. It was something new.
through the pass to Snellbacher, and he went down the sideline. It was toward the end of the ball game, and Otto went on in and scored, but the official called it back to the 11-yard line. And Len McNutt was our quarterback at the time, and we had what we call a quarterback sneak and on the one-yard line, and he carried it over, but and he scored the touchdown, but they took the ball away from him. In time, they uncovered the pile. Uh, they had had possession of the ball. It was less than a minute to go, and of course, that would have tied the ball game. I think the 50, 51, and 52 basketball teams, along with the 1950, 51, and 52 football teams, was probably the best three years combined, both football and basketball, that I can remember. The long grind of practicing and conditioning begins as the Jayhawkers round into shape for their first encounter. The KU coaching staff, too, gathers steam as the strategy for the year is mapped out. Head coach Jewel Sykes, the tall gentleman of football, beginning his fourth year at Kansas, diagrams the KU offense. After finding all receivers covered on an attempted bootleg pass play, Robertson scampers into the end zone for his third scoring play of the evening behind a great block by George Kennard, all-conference guard from Kansas City. Dick Mann fades to throw. All Big 7 defensive ace John Connick gathers it in on the KU 40 and sets sail for the double strike. The final score, Kansas 53, Iowa State 33. Robertson flips to Tice for 30 yards. Tice exhibits some fine broken field running as he goes to the Buffalo 28. Bud Laughlin, who scored 13 touchdowns this season, looks like he would be a good candidate for the basketball team as he picks up his own fumble and rambles eight yards into touchdown land. The players are covered with mud as Galen Fisk, converted to offense for this chore, refuses to be stopped and blasts in for KU's third tally. Marvin Small leads the Kansas Rooters off the train at Lincoln, where the Jayhawks hope to extend their victory string on Husker soil. A large Kansas delegation whoops it up at a pregame pep rally with music by Russell Wiley's KU band. Hogue furnishes another winning wallop with his second touchdown pass of the quarter, this time to Connick. Kyle driving Bud Laughlin bangs through two would-be tacklers for the score. The Jayhawks mark their third straight win at Lincoln, KU 27, Nebraska 7. Bob Hantla of Meade, Kansas, shakes Don Babers loose from the ball, and Merconic recovers on the A&M 3. Laughlin slants over to give Kansas its second touchdown in 46 seconds. Here's the climax of the season, Kansas against Missouri. KU Chancellor Murphy talks over the game with athletic director Dutch Lonberg on the left and faculty representative Dean T. DeWitt Carr. Hogue makes a diving reception just inside the end line. The 1951 Jayhawks established the highest per game scoring average in Mount Orient football history. No individual basketball player uh, in the history of Kansas basketball, in my judgment, I don't know how Doc would stand on this, but he loved and thought a great deal of Clyde. I came back home and Fog Allen was there again. And he would heard uh, by the grapevine that I was not going to come to Kansas. And he said, I've come one more time to, to tell you that with you, we could have a national championship team. And I thought, boy, that's something. If a man came all that way and thought that I could help them win a championship, then maybe that's the type of person I want to play for. Doc's uh, big selling point was, uh, you know, we're going to be, 1952 will be an Olympic year, and if you want to be a part of this team, uh, well then come and join us. Conference forward Bob Kenny, second among the nation's free throw percentage leaders. Bill Lenhard from Newton, one of the finest set shots in Kansas history. Clyde Lavella, two-time All-American center, national major college scoring champion for 1952. Bill Hoagland of Beloit, another three-year regular. The team's only underclass starter, guard Dean Kelly, a junior from McHugh. Lavella is up to sweep the board. Clyde passes long to Lenhard, who in turn hits Kenny, going under for KU's first basket of the year. Dean Kelly hits the post, Lavella takes a return pass, then finds Lenhard in the corner. 
Bill drops an 18-foot set, putting Kansas ahead to stay. Kansas comes back home January 5th to open the conference season as the nation's number one team. Lenhard moves the ball to the post, and Lavellet flips out to Kenny, Bob Kansas' second goal of the evening. Lenhard breaks OU's pattern with a steal, soloing all the way for an easy layup as Kansas wallops Oklahoma. Kenny passes off to Dean Smith, a Topeka junior who rims a 10-foot jump shot as Kansas rolls to an 86-68 victory. Kansas constantly knocks the Cowpokes off balance with its aggressive new switching defense. Hoagland blocks a shot by Don Johnson, steals the ball, and passes to Lavellet on the wing. The big boy misses a hook, but Hogue clears, and Clyde moves to the opposite side to score. The Jayhawks win 66-46, handing the Helms Coach of the Year, Dr. F.C. Allen, the 700th victory of his 42-year career. With Kansas in possession, Kenny finds Lavellet in the middle of the sagging Tiger defense for an easy goal. Kenny swipes a pass by Jack Carby, moves down court, passes to Hoagland, who hits Lenhard on the end line. Lenhard misses, but Lavellet pokes in the rebound. Here Hogue blazes in for a setup off a backhand feed from Lavellet. This victory lifted KU a full game in front of its intrastate rival with a 10-1 conference record. And the Jayhawkers sewed up the flag three nights later at Boulder with a 72-55 lacing of Colorado. The latter win was powered by a single-game conference performance record of 41 points by Lavella. Here's the happy mob scene with the scoreboard indicating KU 78-61 conquest. We've had one of the finest seasons in the history of championship basketball at the University of Kansas. And from a coach's standpoint, it's been most gratifying to have worked with one of the finest groups of boys in the United States and to help them in their climb toward the top of the championship ladder. It's football time again. and Record crowds throng to Memorial Stadium to cheer for the 1952 Jayhawkers. For the first time in history, the Jayhawkers play before a coast-to-coast -coast television audience in the NCAA Game of the Week as they meet Texas Christian at Lawrence. Needing a yard for a first and ten on fourth down, McCown is jolted on the line of scrimmage by a terrific tackle from Morris Cade. 
The Jayhawks shut out the defending Southwest Conference champions, and Coach Sykes is honored as United Press Coach of the Week. Al Clevenger takes the boot on the Jayhawk 30 and crisscrosses with Gil Wright. A good block by Morris Kay springs Gil loose. Bob Hantla and Don Braceland cut down two more Broncos, and the all-Big 7 quarterback outruns two pursuers in a 70-yard touchdown jump. Early in the first quarter, Gil Reich lifts a punt to Colorado's Tom Brookshire. Hit by Morris K. Brookshire fumbles, and John Connick recovers for Kansas on the 35. Charlie Hogue gets KU's first touchdown, blasting six yards on a straight handoff behind George McConnick's excellent block. Hogue scores from 15 yards out on a counter play over right tackle. Jerry Taylor and Joe Lundy lay the final two downfield blocks in a well-executed play. Kilgore carries again, but center Merlin Gish picks off his fumble to preserve the shutout. KU 26, SMU nothing. Kansas strikes early in the third quarter to regain the lead. All-American Gil Wright fakes to fullback Frank Sabatini off tackle, then hits Leone with a scoring pitch between two purple defenders. On fourth down, with the goal line still seven yards away, Leone goes high in the air to take Robertson's touchdown pass. Reich fades to throw again, finds all receivers covered, and burst up the middle in one of his best plays of the year. The score puts Kansas ahead six to nothing. Reaching Missouri's 10 on fourth down, the Jayhawks score when Jerry Robertson passes to Gil Reich, who laterals to Brandeberry at the two. Kansas sets a third quarter drive in motion with Robertson passing down the middle to Galen Fiss. The big fullback laterals to Paul Leone for another 10 yards. This 1952 team played one of the hardest schedules in KU football history and were consistently recognized in national press ratings. And to you, Captain Dean Kelly, you're the only returning regular. And you and the rest of these boys have got to carry a terrific load. Do you think you can do it? I think you can do it. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 Kansas fans, players, and coaches rejoice as the Jayhawkers earn their way to the finals in Kansas City. The Jayhawks surge to an astounding 8 to nothing lead before the favored Huskies are able to put up a shot. B.H. Bourne, the tournament's most valuable player, blocks the Washington shot. Patterson clears the rebound, and the Jayhawks break fast. Gil Wright scores with a sensational shoot shot. The Jayhawks demolish the Pacific Coast champion 79-53 to to become Western champions for the second straight year. For the national championship, the Kansas Jayhawks meet the Indiana Hoosiers, champions of the Big Ten Conference. Wright beats center B.H. Bourne, who buckets the left hook, and the Jayhawks are back on top. Jerry Albert's last ditch attempt hits near the edge of the ring, and Indiana wins the first one-point championship victory in tournament annals, 69 to 68. B.H. Bourne receives his most valuable player award, the first in history to a member of the runner-up team. These are the faces of champions carrying on the great tradition of basketball at Kansas. We dedicated the field house in 1955. And the one thing I remember about the field house was that it was so huge. Uh, I believe we said at that time that it seated some 17,000 people. And from 1955 until the time I graduated, that place was never empty. He'd want to be remembered as a friend of the youth. He would have been a great influence in these times if he were here. I can remember first driving down Main Street in Lawrence, Kansas, and seeing Santee on a license plate with um, 
a golden running foot or something like that. And I think, wow, there's something different about this. Is not New York, era. <laughs> you know. And then I met Wes, okay, and watch him punish himself in one of those training sessions, and realized that um, you know there were some serious people around here. Al Order was came on the scene later on and and did a tremendous job in winning four gold medals in the Olympic Games and. On each one of those uh, cases, except for one, he was not the favorite. He, he broke his own Olympic record on each occasion. One of the secrets of having a good team is to get well-rounded young men who have a desire to be uh, good in that particular event and uh, move from there. paper had called and uh, said, uh, Dr. Allen, we understand that Wilt Chamberlain is going to enroll at the University of Kansas. What do you think about that? And he said, well, that's certainly great news. He said, I hope he comes out for basketball. <laughs> he really was a tremendous athlete and he evidenced that by his performances at the Kansas Relays on the track team. You know, he could go out and uh, be an outstanding performer in track. I can still see him in the high jump. Uh, uh, with his freshman beanie cap and uh, and a two or three step approach that was covered tremendous yardage. You always think of someone that's over seven feet tall as being uh, somewhat awkward. He was probably one of the best coordinated, one of the strongest human beings that I had ever seen. Uh, he was a tremendous potential, at least in a, as a decathlon athlete. Chamberlain blocks to Parker, who passes down court to Elston. He feeds back to King for a 20-foot jumper. King cans his famous right-hand floater for two more points as the Jayhawkers set a new Missouri game scoring record at 92 to 79. A capacity crowd of 17,000 fans watches Kansas come from behind in the last four and a half minutes for a 51 to 45 triumph. Here, Chamberlain hits Elston, cutting through the Wildcat zone for a setup. Watch Chamberlain move inside the six foot nine inch Jack Parr to finger home a rebound. Chamberlain puts Kansas ahead for keep, scoring a tip in for two of his 31 points. And KU beats the Wildcats. He's virtually as valuable on defense as offense. Here's why twice. Here the Kansas team departs Allen Fieldhouse for its flight to Dallas and the Western NCAA Regional Tournament. The Jayhawks are to open against Southern Methodist Southwest Conference champions. Kansas is two points behind with 30 seconds to play, but a great cut shot by Elston sends it into overtime at 59 off. Kansas pulls it out 73-65 as Will stuffs the final goal. 
Here's the big one. The Kansas Jayhawks go for the national championship against the Tar Heels of North Carolina, coached by Frank McGuire, unbeaten in 31 consecutive games. The Big Dipper deflects a rebound, gets a return pass from Lineski, and scores. As North Carolina's All-American Lenny Rosenbluth fouls out, Kansas' hopes are high. But the Tar Heels pull it up to a tie at the end of regulation play. Now the Carolinians pull into a lead. The Jayhawks need a field goal desperately, and Chamberlain gets it as the game goes into a second overtime at 48 all. The second overtime remains scoreless as Chamberlain makes a sensational block of Tommy Kern's drive-in. It's 48 all as the third overtime period begins. But goals like this one by Chamberlain were not enough and the Tar Heels lead by one with five seconds to go. KU's one chance fails and the Tar Heels of North Carolina celebrate their unblemished season. Dejected because of the narrow loss, Chamberlain takes consolation in being voted the tournament's most valuable player. Jack Mitchell had some great teams along uh, in uh, uh, 59, 60, 61. In 1960, I remember the 1960 season very vividly because Kansas that year played three teams that were rated number one when they played in the final game that year. They went down and beat Missouri, and at that time Missouri was number one in the nation, and uh, that was one of the greatest uh, wins I can ever remember of Kansas in football. Down under is the Kansas quarterback, Roger McFarlane. He pitches one up the middle. It's a Kansas touchdown. Sam Simpson picks it off. And that is the second touchdown of the year, and it was executed just about like it was in the Nebraska game. High captains Kurt McLennan, Stan Kirschman, and John Hadle, along with head football coach Jack Mitchell. There never was more fan interest created than the 1961 team. This was probably due to the tremendous finish of the previous year, the return of 14 seniors, including key backfield personnel, and high preseason recognition on the TCU one-yard line. Left halfback Lee Flashpark takes a pitch out and scores with seven minutes remaining in the first quarter. He rolls left, takes the pitch out, keeps his footing, and John Hadel rolls clear down to the three-yard line, picking up 40 yards before he is finally hauled down. In slot left formation, quarterback John Hadle rolls left and scores. Ken Coleman is called upon to get his first collegiate touchdown. He barges over from the three-yard line. The Big H's finest triple threat halfback and quarterback shows his versatility and ability to make a split-second decision on this play. He rolls right at the last second pitches to Kurt McClendon in the end zone. Three-time all-conference right halfback Kurt McClendon goes over from the 19-yard line as he bowls over a pair of Buffalo defenders. Once again, the football goes to John Hadle, and in a die play, he scores. John Hadle crosses the goal line from the five. KU is moving the ball from the Oklahoma 38 with John Hadle handling the football. John has finally stopped him at 29. A nine-yard game for the Kansas quarterback. Now the Jayhawks try some razzle-dazzle. McFarland to Hadel. Hadel rolling right spots Larry Allen on the 10-yard line. The pass is complete, and Allen goes over to score. He dodges four would-be Oklahoma tacklers. John Hadel from left halfback gets off a brilliant 74-yard quick kick. This boot actually spanned the length of the field, but it was not called a 94-yarder due to the fact that it rolled into the end zone. Here's John Hadel rolling left. And with four minutes left to go in the first half, he gets by four tacklers to score from the 11-yard line. Hadle goes back to throw this touchdown pass. Oklahoma State coach Cliff Spiegel said this was the play of the game. With a 14-0 lead with six minutes to play in the third period, Hadle rolls left. And it's McFarland at the 15 who goes all the way. With the ball in the eighth, John Hadle rolls left, and he scores standing up in the first quarter. In the closing minutes, John Hadle goes back to pass to Kurt McClendon. Kurt's very clear for KU's final tally, and the Jayhawks flank Kansas State 34-0. This club made a remarkable comeback by winning seven of his final eight games, and it proved they could whip a difficult throw of the rice caliber on any given afternoon.
I was recruited by about 200 uh, colleges when I uh, left uh, uh, Central High School in Omaha, Nebraska. I knew that I didn't want to go uh, a long way away from my uh, home. And uh, University of Kansas, Lawrence, Kansas, was only about uh, 180 miles from Omaha, Nebraska. Bill Easton was an, uh, a great track coach. Uh, will go down as one of the best of all times uh, all over the country. And uh, I ran track with Bill, and he really taught me the meaning of really getting into shape. I always felt that I was in great shape uh, when I played football, but when I was on his track team, uh, he showed me how to get in shape, and so uh, I will never forget him for that. When he came out for, uh, for track, why we started working him in the sprints and in the low hurdles, as well as in the long jump. And uh, he, he began to come along, but of course his love was football, and he, he knew he knew that he could run. He knew that he could run right straight at you and you never lay a hand on him. He, it was one of those situations that he had that innate ability with great reflexes and uh, with the speed that he had that we gave to him in the sprints. Originally working him in sprints was for football, not for track at all.
He was the best that I ever saw, including the kids that you see now, I think. Uh, he did some fantastic things. Uh, when he had the ball, he'd stop on a dime and change directions without changing speeds. Franco's pass is perfect. It's an eight-yard touchdown. Steve played football and was a great one. In fact, I think he was the last uh, three-sport letterman we had. He uh, lettered in football, basketball, and baseball. Why, well, I said, well, I think Billy Mills is ready. They said, what are you saying? I said, I think Billy Mills is ready to run 10,000 meters. I think he's going to whip somebody. Well, they thought I was a young coach and just going off the top of his head and there wasn't anything in between. But, but actually, the whole thing was that Billy needed someone to pat him on the back. I was taken in a number of frustrations that I had been receiving from society in general out on Coach Easton, the only man who was really there and in a position to help me. And as I realized that, I, I started having a different type of an attitude. I made the Olympic team. From the moment I finished, I knew I was going to win the gold medal. I knew it was going to happen. I put down in my workout book my time, 28 minutes and 25 seconds. Believe, 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 believe. Billy ran a great race. And where the guys running against him made their mistake was in shoving him around. He was shoved twice. As long as you blame somebody else for your failures, you better be prepared to do one thing, and that's to continue to fail. Momentarily, I quit. I, I didn't quit the race. I, I was going to accept third place. Then it was just the thought deep down inside, just one more try. But Camuti goes out ahead as Camuti right now leading in the 10,000 meter run clock is third. Rather, Bill Mills is in third. Ron Clark is in second right now. This is the final lap for the 10,000 meter. The unheralded Mahout Gamuti of Tunis is putting on a tremendous sprint. He's out ahead of Ron Clark. Bill Mills, the United States, is in third place. This will certainly be the fastest 10,000 meter ever run by an American. I came off the final curve. My thoughts starting to change from one more try, one more try to I can win, I can win, I can win. And they come down the final lap. Can Ron Clark catch the Moody? They're going through the field. He's coming up. He's passing the Moody. Look at Mills. Look at Mills. Look at Mills. Look at Mills. And the moment I broke the tape at the games and the Japanese official asked me the question, who are you? I was ushered aside and I could be alone. And so powerfully from, from my subconscious to the conscious mind kept coming the, the sound or the feeling or the attitude that he knows, he knows, dad knows. The longest pass play of the year came down at Lubbock, Texas. With the ball at the three yard line, Brendan backs up the throw. He fires it downfield the 40 yard line. Willie Ray Smith makes a great catch. At the 50, he is going and gone for a 97 yard bomb. Walking up and down Mount Orient, that hill drove me crazy because the track was at the lower end of the Campanile Hill and all the classes were on the top of the hill. And I come from New York City, there are no hills around here, right? So that's the thing I remember. It was a good school, obviously, uh, and we worked hard out there. Coach Easton, uh, track coach at that time, uh, was a good proselyter. He could bring in a lot of people and he brought in some very fine athletes, okay, and we won some national championships.
a seventh grader, he tried to sprint. He wasn't fast enough to make the team. As an eighth grader, he tried to hurdle, and he was too awkward to make the team. And as a ninth grader, he decided he was going to try to make the sprint medley relay. And the longest distance in that was a quarter. But he wasn't fast enough to make that. So he didn't even let her in junior high. Actually uh, lived 50 yards from Southeast High School in Wichita and, and came to East High School, which was about three miles away from his home, mainly because his intent was to take up vocations and not to go on to college. But after he got there, uh, things started to happen for him, and, and he went from a, a 539 mile to 4078 mile in, in his sophomore year, and then by the, the junior year, why he'd, he'd run the first four minute mile by a high schooler in, in the United States. I don't think I was totally aware of the real tradition that existed here at the University of Kansas. Uh, I came originally because Bob Timmons, Coach Bob Timmons, was coming and I wanted to follow him. He had been my high school coach. And then upon arrival, I became aware of all the things that were happening and had happened. And it was, it was very nice to be a part of the program. It was a real special feeling. It was one of those days that we had put a lot of preparation into, a lot of planning, a lot of prayer, and a lot of uh, counseling with the meet director, uh, because we had asked ahead of time if we could get some assistance from the PA system to have them announce the splits along the way in the race. Uh, as the race developed, there were several other runners who decided that they would like to help because they knew that a few weeks before I had missed the world record by a tenth of a second. So there were three other men in that race who should have had their name on that world record. And they went out and led a lap and then a half mile all the way up to about a lap and a half to go. And it was really unusual to have them more or less sacrifice the race. The thing that really drove home uh, the significance of that race was that evening as I went back and I sat down and was watching the evening news of Walter Cronkite and at the very end he broke in and he said we had a very special event that took place in uh, Berkeley, California uh, for the first time in 30 some years an American now holds the world record at one mile and they broke and went back to some footage of that race and I sat there and I thought boy you know, that's, that's interesting uh, it must be pretty significant for them to break into the national knees and do that. It's something about uh, Jim Ryan too. He He's about to get into the Masters at 40. He's a year away, and he's still running, and he still loves it, and uh, it's, a, it's still a big part of his life. Pepper was a great guy to play for. It was a, a great thing for me to have Pepper come in when he did. Uh, we needed uh, to stabilize our football program uh, and also, I think, uh, revitalize the program. Pepper is very good at doing that. Uh, uh, Pepper's a very knowledgeable football man. We had a lot of talent at Kansas then, and uh, we needed to get a coach like Pepper in there, uh, someone to really get the program going again and uh, he did a great job.
When you beat a fine football team like Nebraska in their own backyard, you have to be proud. For the first time in the season, KU was behind in the fourth quarter. But with the running of Douglas, Shanklin, Reeves, and the Wiggins brothers, the Big Blue ground out a great drive of power football to eat up the clock and go ahead. I scrambled more than anything else, although we did have a couple running plays for the quarterback. Uh, uh, we, had, we, had, we had a great offensive football team. It started like the other KU game. Powerful offense and a quick lead to make it 26 to three at the half. As the third quarter started, the defense took over to ice the game. Emory Hicks blocked this punt and All-American in John Zook scored his first college touchdown. Big H Conference, uh, football-wise, is probably the toughest conference in the nation, I, I believe. I think if you look at the, a good uh, barometer or yardstick would, would be to look at the number of uh, big eight players on National Football League team rosters. Yeah. Starting on the third play of the game, John Riggin fell it for a game total of 161 yards and two touchdowns. Behind the hard-charging offensive line, led by Pete Christensen and Ken Wurzberger. In the second quarter, he pounded over for his first touchdown. Bobby Douglas ran and passed for 195 yards. There were the quick shots, the flare to the side. Then the bullets, like the touchdown pass to Junior Reagan. Easy to see why he holds the Big 8 record of 97 passes without an interception. The bomb from Douglas to McGowan was one of the great plays of the year. He caught passes for 150 yards against the Sooners. The game was iced when big John Wiggins roared 82 yards to set up the score. Bobby Douglas took it in and added another in the fourth quarter. Senior Hawk Dave Morgan made the first great play. In this game, it was the Jayhawk defense which made the big play, led by the ball hawking of Dave Morgan. But one of the biggest was this pass to John Mosier in the rain and near darkness. With a first down, KU kept the ball to end the game. It was a big win for the Big Blue to give them the co-championship of the Big Eight. It was a great season, and another reward was a trip to Miami to play in the Orange Bowl against Penn State.
We were ahead 14 to seven in the last few seconds. They completed a long pass down inside of our five yard line, I believe. In the confusion with Penn State getting their uh, goal line offense and us and University of Kansas getting our goal line defense in, we got too many men on the field. We had 12 men on the field. Actually, Penn State ran three plays against our 12 man defense before they scored, and actually they scored on a, uh, a broken play. Uh, Penn State then lined up and go to go for the two-point conversion, and we held them the first time. And it was that that point that the officials detected our 12th man on the field, penalized us half the distance to the goal line, removed one of our men, and got back to 11-man defense, and they scored a two-point conversion that to win 15 to 14, I think, with about 15 seconds left to go in the game. Big disappointment for us. I appreciate having an opportunity to speak to you. I need your help. This is a difficult campaign. It's difficult here in the state of Kansas. I'm going to be involved in a primary in the state of Nebraska and these other states. If you feel strongly about what we can do here in this country, if you feel strongly about the future and the fact that we can change the course of action of this country, not only in Southeast Asia, but all around the rest of the world and here in the United States, I ask for your help. I remember it very well. You know, it was a great speech. And uh, uh, at that time, you know, there were uh, a lot of activists around and so on and so forth. Kansas has always been a, uh, I would have to say, a very liberal school uh, from a student standpoint. And uh, I remember the speech well, yeah. With JoJo, we were ranked in the top five at that same time. But then we built it back up into the early 70s, 1971. We went to the Final Four. But we had a, a good bunch of athletes. That particular bit of larceny executed by big number 40, Dave Robich. Six foot, 10 inch, 235 pounder from Springfield, Illinois. Team captain Pierre Russell will add the final point. Desperation shot by the Sooners' Andy Pettis will be off the mark. Kansas will win the Big Eight Conference Championship. Kansas proved throughout the year to be a great second half team, and the win in Lawrence over Missouri was no exception. Watch the great Kansas ingredient, defense and rebounding. Aubrey Nash feeds Dave Robich in the corner. Again, the Jayhawks go inside to the big man, a key point in the Kansas attack. Robich gets two more. Big number 40 hit 29 points against the Cougars matching his best output of the season. They're 27 and 1, and so are we, and we think we can beat them. Let's go, Hawk! The outside shooting of Pierre Russell was a factor in the first half. What the Jayhawks had to do was get the ball inside to Robich. When they did, he produced positive results. I'm looking at him. Randy, you're taking it out. Get away from him, Sally. What's behind you? Make it a clean foul. Get the hands off of him. Face guarding. Face guarding. Run face guarding. Kansas appeared rejuvenated as Bud Stallworth drove for a basket. Less than two minutes into the half, Kansas had UCLA reeling and Dave Robish tied the score at 33 all. Come down the floor and I hit a jump shot, which would have put us ahead of UCLA for the first time in the game and probably swing the momentum in our favor and the official calls a traveling call on me. So of all my moments in college, I remember a traveling call the most. It was disappointing not to win the national championship, but as I look back, just getting to the final four is a special time. Ron Jesse, a national champion in the long jump, a conference champion in the hurdles, played for the Rams and, and, uh, and also Detroit. Uh, um, there are great memories of people that, that did super jobs in more than one sport. The Jayhawks and Wildcats opened the Big 8 race with identical 3 and one records. The Jayhawks were ranked 18th nationally, a ranking earned in a thrilling 28-27 setback by 7th-ranked Tennessee a week earlier in Memphis. 
Many wondered how Kansas would respond to that loss. With just 19 seconds to play before intermission, James links up with Bruce Adams, and the junior from Westwood, Kansas, makes another typical catch, ignoring defensive pass interference to give Kansas an 11-point lead at halftime. With just 64 seconds to play and the goal line just inches away, James tries a quarterback sneak and slides off an angry Kansas State defense into the end zone for the winning touchdown. James then carried for the two-point conversion to give Kansas a seven-point lead. Against the Volunteers, David James threw a record 58 times, a record 35 completions for 394 yards and three touchdowns, including this toss to running back Robert Miller, who shows both good hands and quick feet. And this picture-perfect pump fake and throw to lonely end Bruce Adams. But records did fall. As Emmett Edwards helped Dave James set a big eight career record for touchdown passes with this 57 yard jam against Oklahoma. Another Kansas defensive jam in 73 was this James Bowman interception of an Oklahoma pass. The senior from Kansas City threads the sidelines for 92 yards and a touchdown as Kansas scored 20 points against the mighty Sooners. Nolan Cromwell was a super athlete in track and field, uh, ran the intermediate hurdles and was right at the top of the nation uh, in, in that event. And then indoors, made the All-American team in the 600. And it was kind of interesting because uh, people would come up around him on an indoor track and see this great big bulky guy and say, well, you know, I'm going right on by. But he was such a great competitor that they really had to struggle to get by him. As everybody knows, just an unbelievable football player, a defensive back until he was moved to wishbone quarterback. And in his first game as wishbone quarterback, he ran for almost 300 yards, set a new school record, and uh, subsequently went on to lead the Jayhawks to a victory over number one ranked Oklahoma in his position as a wishbone quarterback. Nolan Crowell is going to keep the ball off tackle here on our triple option play behind fine blocking the offensive line. and. Uh, takes it in for a, a, a score and sort of finishes off a good night for us. Nolan uh, Cromwell keeping off tackle and drug about three or four guys into the end zone. And uh, our offensive line uh, did an excellent job blocking right there and, and enabled him to take the ball on in. This is one of the pass plays uh, early in the ball game. Uh, Nolan faked the triple option and then throws to Waddell Smith for the touchdown pass. Since 1974, I've had an opportunity to be involved uh, with the progression in women's sports and more specifically women's basketball. And uh, er the early days, of course, uh, we ran into similar problems that the men shared. We didn't have money for scholarship. Uh, we had a very limited schedule, but to see our program grow uh, to the point where we now are pr very proud of our All-Americans, uh, our Big A championship titles, uh, Olympians, and of course, uh, the only school in the United States that has the opportunity to say that we have the first woman to play for the Harlem Globetrotters, it's just a real thrill for me. We had only intramural sports. They wouldn't have dreamed of letting the women get out and play other colleges. In addition to being only the second player named to the Kodak All-American team for four consecutive years, Lynette Woodard also became the all-time leading scorer in the history of women's collegiate basketball with 3,649 points an average of 26.3 points per game. Her prowess on the basketball court earned her the prestigious Wade Trophy in 1981. The trophy is annually recognizing the best player in women's collegiate basketball. This trophy is equivalent to the Heisman Trophy given in men's football. She was also named to the 1980 United States Olympic team and twice to the academic All-American teams. The thing that uh that I had the opportunity to do was to be a part of the tradition here because as a child growing up in Wichita that's all you you heard about Kansas was the big school in Kansas and uh, as I became more aware of the things that were involved here and uh, all the rituals and the tradition and the the uh, just the tremendous atmosphere that's created by all that uh, I just thought that uh, you know, it, it made the selecting of what college I wanted to go to very easy. Coach Owens, he was a, a, a people's person. He was a, a very good PR man, a very good heart, 
uh, big heart. Each basketball player is dependent, his success and the success of the team is dependent on each one assuming his responsibility and fulfilling uh, his own particular role. There are a number of reasons that basketball has been so great at the University of Kansas. I'd have to point to one of the most important reasons, and I, I feel that is the great fan support that uh, we have. And it makes you want to do a much better job uh, so that we don't let our great fans down. It was a good experience to play for someone like Ted because uh, uh, he, he, he brought the human nature into the game and it wasn't just compete, compete, compete and don't care about, about the, the players and individual. He really cared about the players and I think that's an extension of just how the university, they try to uh, care about uh, each individual player and, and try to make sure that that player or, or that individual gets some, some type of attention to feel the, uh, the goodness of uh, being here. I'll tell you what, this is one of the most exciting times in you know, my career here so far. I've always dreamed about coming back and coming home and playing in front of you know, the people that I know and that kind of stuff. And just to play a tradition like USC is even a big incentive. It was a great day for the affable young coach Gottfried. His team's victory enabled him to be honored as the National Coach of the Week by United Press International. The 1983 renewal of the rivalry was one of the most thrilling ever with the Jayhawks prevailing over the bold bound Tigers 37-27. Sire earned the cheers of the fans when he broke two important Big 8 records, most yards passing for a career and most yards passing in a single season. Frank fired two touchdown passes to Johnson. It's my pleasure today to introduce that gentleman who will be our head basketball coach at the University of Kansas, Larry Brown. Larry? Older people connected with the university um, would understand about Kansas' tradition, but kids, um, tradition to them is who's been to the Final Four the last three or four years. As Kansas began postseason play, they still had one more mountain they would climb. Against Alcorn State in the first round of the tournament, KU had to fight off not only the quick Braves, but themselves in surviving a scary 58-57 win. Trailing all night long because of their own poor shooting and because of Alcorn's fine play, Kansas needed Ron Kellogg's rebound basket and Carl Henry's stick back with 14 seconds left to win the game. Kelly Knight secured the victory with a game-saving blocked shot of what looked like a sure basket at the buzzer by Alcorn. like an historian uh, in terms of basketball and when I uh, thought about the idea of coming here um, to a university that James Naismith once coached and Coach Smith and, and Adolph Rupp and people like that were, were part of, um, it meant a great deal to me.
I was hopeful we'd be an excellent team. I had no idea we'd win 35 games. Um, as the season went on, I really felt we had the best team in the country. It was an exciting year, and I've been told by many people that this is a year they're going to remember for a long time. I was excited for the fact that um, we were able to get to the finals. I was really disappointed that we didn't win at all. But when you look back on it in retrospect, um, you got to be proud of what the team accomplished. We think with, with Larry Brown, we're in the high cotton. I thought it was the prettiest town I'd ever seen. I have never seen another campus anywhere that remotely compares to the beauty of the campus here at the University of Kansas. It was a farm community, 7,000 people, and everybody knew everybody in the town. And I sort of fell in love with the town first. I really know that you don't get something for nothing and you have to work, and a lot of that started at the university. I enjoyed my days uh, as a football player there, as an athlete. I enjoyed my days uh, as a student. I learned a great deal, and uh, you learn just by being involved with uh, 14, 15,000 students. And, and uh, the, the degrees that I received from the university, I, I wouldn't trade for anything in the world. The height of competition, the ultimate in competition, is not for me to compete against you, or me to compete against West Santee or, or Al Order, but for every one of us simply to reach within the depths of our capabilities. I think the atmosphere here is very, very wholesome and healthy. Do you feel like you've died and gone to heaven? 